Did you ever wonder why, in North America, televisions run at a frame rate of 29.97 frames per second? I mean, what a ridiculous frame rate. I came across the inconvenience of this number recently when I was making a video and I was trying to manually assemble some frames back to some footage. And it got me thinking, where did this come from? And I couldn't find a nice, coherent, concise explanation online, so I had a bit of a dig into the technical details and I thought I'd make a video explaining how this came to be. It comes down to how these old CRT screens used to work. At the back is a cathode ray, it sends a beam of electrons forward, wherever they hit the screen, the screen lights up and then electromagnets back here can steer that dot around on the screen. To produce an image, you need to scan it across the screen. And if that dot is small enough, and if the dot is moving fast enough, you can vary its brightness. And because of the way the human eye works, it will perceive the brightness as an image. And so as you can see here, a rapidly scanning dot is producing a picture of me, and then another picture of me. In fact, there are infinitely many of me. That is pretty good value. The electron beam didn't actually do the whole image in one pass, it took two passes. The first pass, it would put the top row in, and then every second row all the way down, the odd positions. It would then do a second pass and fill in the even positions, and this is what's called interlaced video. Because of the human persistence of vision, we wouldn't see two different passes, we would just see the complete frame. And in North America, TV was broadcast with 525 horizontal rows, which you may have noticed is an odd number. Each pass of the beam would do 262 and a half rows. The weird half thing was because of the geometry of how the beam gets back to the top and you want to take the same amount of time for both of the passes so everything stays in alignment. But that, that's the basics behind interlaced video. When TVs were first built, it would have made sense to do two of those passes 24 times a second to match what cinema movies ran at. They were 24 frames a second. However, these home appliances were plugged into the normal household electrical supply. And in North America, that's alternating current running at 60 hertz. So to make them easier to build and to avoid interference from other things, they used the electricity to time the scans. And because it took two scans of the beam for every image, it meant your TV was running at 30 frames a second. What a perfectly logical and sensible frame rate. The problem was with the introduction of color. The 30 frames per second system was for black and white TV, and in 1953, color TV hit the airwaves, and that ruined everything. TV in the 1950s was sent as an analog signal over radio waves. Each TV channel was given its own spot in the electromagnetic spectrum, specifically a 6 megahertz window to send all of its data. Now the first quarter of a megahertz it couldn't use because it's a kind of wasteland, a buffer between channels. It couldn't really use the next 1 megahertz either because it was a build up to the picture signal. After that you get all the interesting data about the picture and finally four and a half megahertz later you get the audio signal and then after that another wasted quarter of a megahertz of wind down. Then above that you would get another wasteland and the next station above it. They were packed in fairly tight. So in reality each channel didn't get six megahertz, they just got this one four and a half megahertz gap to send all of the image and audio data. When color TV came along in 1953, the color data had to be put somewhere in that four and a half megahertz window, but it needed to be positioned carefully so it didn't disrupt the pre-existing picture and sound information. It looked like this was gonna be a major problem. The color signal did interfere with the picture and sound signals in a way that produced visible artifacts. It was distorting the picture and that was not acceptable. So the technicians had to find a way to fix that. And thankfully, there's a thing called line by line phase reversal. And even though I don't fully understand how that works, I do know what the criteria are to be able to use it. And it comes down to the two gaps. The gap between the picture frequency and the color frequency, and the difference between color and sound. 
In order for line-by-line -line phase reversal to hide the artifacts, both of these distances had to be an odd integer multiple of the horizontal frequency divided by two. The horizontal frequency is just the number of horizontal lines being drawn every second. We know that if you add these two differences together, you get the complete four and a half megahertz window for the entire signal. And we can now do some simplification. Well, we know if you're adding two odd numbers together, you're gonna to get an even number out the other side. We can move the half over there. And if you half any even number, you're just gonna get some integer. And so the moral of the story is that we need an integer multiple of the horizontal frequency to equal our total interval of four and a half megahertz, which is of course just 4,500,000. Well, let's see if it works. The horizontal frequency is equal to, well, every frame is 525 horizontal rows and we're running that at 30 frames per second. If you multiply them together, we get 15,750 out the other side. That is our horizontal frequency. We can then try dividing both sides up here by the horizontal frequency and we hope to get an integer out the other side. Very sadly, we don't. We get 285.714 and then a bunch of other digits. And the poor engineers must have been like, oh, that's so close. Imagine, imagine if that was 286. That would solve all of our problems, but it's not. For that to be 286, we would need a different horizontal frequency. In fact, we would need a horizontal frequency of 15,734.25. And we haven't, well, we would have that if instead of a 30 frame per second rate, we had a, you got it, 29.97 frames per second. And so that's what they did. They adjusted the frames per second to make this number here an integer and remove the interference between the new color signal and the old picture and sound signals. So there you are. North American television has a frame rate of 29.97 frames per second because if you multiply that by the number of horizontal rows in each frame and then you multiply that by an integer, happens to be 286, you get out a whole number which matches exactly the frequency window this data is sent over. This system of broadcast is called NTSC and it was put in place in the 1950s by the National Television Systems Committee. And so now you know what NTSC stands for. It stands for not the smartest choice. Surely there must be a better option than 29.97. Well, let's have a look what happened in Europe. Europe has PAL television that's based on a 50 hertz power supply. And so at two scans a frame, you get a 25 frame per second rate. PAL has more horizontal lines than NTSC. It's got 625. Whenever you have someone going on and on about how PAL is better quality than NTSC, it's because it's got an extra 100 horizontal lines. It has technically got better resolution. And in Europe, there's a slightly bigger window to send the data of. There's actually a full six megahertz window just for the data that's actually sending the TV signals. So the PAL technicians must have been thinking, oh, come on, how close are we going to be to an integer multiple? And it turns out exactly 384 precisely. And you might think, wow, they got lucky. But in fact, this was deliberate. PAL came into place because of color television. Europe had a look at North America and went, what a mess. Let's just do a new system from the ground up and make it work. And that's why in Europe to this day, we have a nice and tidy interlay standard. Whereas in North America, it's this ridiculousness. The question now is, was there a better option. Instead of changing the frame rate, what if instead they had changed the window over which the data is sent? What if they just moved these out slightly to make these integer multiples? Unfortunately, that wasn't possible. The standards for this were immovable. They were not allowed to go outside of that four and a half megahertz range. The only other thing they could change would be the horizontal lines. And this, in my personal opinion, is what they should have done. 
So let's say we want to keep the frame rate at 30 frames per second and we're going to change the number of horizontal lines. How many are we going to need? Well, assuming we only want to increase the number of lines, we don't want to decrease them and lose quality in the new standard. And assuming we still need an odd number, so we get the half line geometry for the beam's movement, then the next compatible number of horizontal lines above 525 is 625 with a nice multiple of 240. Yes, the NTSC standard could have been the same number of lines as PAL. We could have had two much more compatible standards if they had changed the horizontal lines instead of the frequency. But they didn't, they changed the frame rate instead and we've been stuck with this ridiculous number ever since. Although we can't be too harsh in judgment, their motivation at the time was to make the transition as smooth as possible. And by slightly tweaking just the frame rate, this was very backwards compatible. Almost no one would notice this change. Their theory was if they do their job correctly, no one would be sure they had done anything at all. The final moral of the story is just that conventions hang around for a very long time. Because of human nature, we can't have abrupt changes in technology. People need to be transitioned from one to the next. Standards have to be continuous for some definition of continuous. And that makes them incredibly tenacious. Now I know a lot of people who watch my videos work in the tech sector and you're responsible for coming up with standards and conventions and a lot of young people watch these videos. You're going to come up with the conventions and standards of the future. So all of you, please, when you're coming up with new ideas, just spare a thought that your grandkids may one day still be locked in to the same standard. Although that said, I still got my video made despite having to deal with 29.97 frames per second. If you're curious, it was the one I did with Henry Segerman with the spherical cameras because we had to export all the frames, mess with them in Python, and then put them back together. I'll put a link to that video in the description. So, you know, people coming up with conventions, I guess, actually, we don't care. A convention that exists is better than something that doesn't. So if you can bodge it together and it works, go for it. I mean, don't worry, the people of the future will find out a way to deal with it. Okay, according to my YouTube statistics, at this point in a video of all the people who've watched it, only 30% of them are still paying attention. Most people watch the interesting bit and then they don't pay attention when I'm just rambling on at the end. And so those of you who are still paying attention, you are my people. And so I have a special announcement just for you. You're all incredibly supportive and a lot of people have asked, when am I going to set up a Patreon page and I've finally done it. I have set up a Patreon page and this is kind of a soft launch. I'll do a proper launch later and I'll follow Patreon good practice by having a video about what I'll be doing. But for now, I thought I'll just mention it at the end of this video. If you'd like to, please do click the link in the description, go and check it out. If you're not familiar with Patreon, you can support me a bit like you would a Kickstarter, but it's ongoing. The idea is people who can afford it donate money so I can do these videos better and in return I have all sorts of rewards. So uh, have a look at it, give me some feedback, let me know if there's things there you do want, things there you don't want. I'm gonna have fun making a bit of extra content for Patreon. In fact, I'm going to do a behind the scenes video of this video I've just made because you wouldn't believe the ridiculous tech around me it took to make this all work. And because I haven't got any Patreon supporters yet, I'm just going to put it on my Patreon channel and anyone can see it. So do go check out my Patreon. The link is at the very top of the description, unsurprisingly. I would love to make more videos and do them better. And so your support is hugely appreciated. So go check it out and I'd love some feedback on it before I do the proper launch. Let me know if the rewards are what you want or if there's anything else I can add in there for you. I really appreciate you all supporting these videos.